Hey, welcome to Life Church. We're so excited that you've tuned in to worship with us today. And as we enter into this moment of worship, we pray that you would open your heart and ready yourself to receive all that God has to speak to you.
Thank you.
Hey, good morning, Life Church. Thank you so much for joining with us. We're grateful for the opportunity to gather in this way. Uh, we're continuing our series, Reset, A Divine Approach to Our Earthly Affairs. And really, our whole premise for this is that we need a change. Um, yeah, we're having this conversation in the shadows of a worldwide pandemic, e extreme political partisanship, and a very inflammatory conversation involving race inequality, privilege, and, as well as layers upon layers of abuse of power. But, but I would submit to us that the wider we has always been in need of a reset. There's a familiar passage in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 where the writer says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but but he's patient towards you not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance uh, other versions say that God would have none perish and all be repentant the notion that I want to just drill in on for a moment is that God has two favorite numbers none that none would perish and, and none would slide down to their own devices and, and all that God would have all of us be remade renewed and even reset so within that frame of context let's read our hallmark passage of scripture from Romans chapter 8 Paul writes for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Skip down to verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purposes. In verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? Let's pray. Uh, Father, Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity once again to gather in this way. Uh, we ask for help to our leadership, our government, uh, the sciences. God, we ask for your spirit to bring healing, physical and emotional, to all those who are in need. We just uh, announce that we love you, we trust you, and we honor you. And as we give you these moments, Father, we ask that you would use them to mold us, shape us, make us more into your image. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen and amen. You know, as we're continuing the conversation of reset and speaking in terms of repentance, uh, creating something new out of the old, I mean, how does one go about doing that? How do we do what we've never done? How do we consider what we've never even seen or remotely thought about as a possibility? Uh, I recently uh, had an issue with my car. My Nissan Sentra is 20 years old and it's in great shape, although there are parts being held together by tape and the, yes, the back bumper is being bolted in and yes, the side mirror did fall off and it was fine taped with duct tape, but then the hot temperature came and that melted and so I upped my mechanical game and I zip corded my side view mirror. So but the fact of the matter is my Nissan Sentra is fine. However, over the last 20 years, I've had issues with the starter. It's the only thing that's gone. I have the original clutch. I have so many things that have lasted me the whole run. But this last time, I knew the starter was going and I didn't want to take it to a shop largely because I didn't want to pay the money, but also I didn't want to have that time away from my car. So I called my good friend David Scott here at Life Church and I said, hey, the starter's going. What do you think? And he said to me, these were his words, he said, Christoph, you can do it. You can change the starter. 
Now, I'm grateful for his confidence in myself because I didn't have it. But I went on his word that I could change a starter. I Googled some things. I saw some YouTube videos and found, lo and behold, hey, maybe I could do this. Called up an auto parts store, went in, bought the part, set aside some time, and I started taking my car apart. I want to announce to you today that my car starts every time, and I praise Jesus because I fixed it. I can still hear all of the conversations I had with David. He said, well, you can look for this, and you can look for that, but you can do it. You're going you're gonna to do a good job. Let me just say, the reset that God has for each and every one of us is going to take more than a few YouTube videos. It's going to take more than seminars and conversations with people who even know what they're talking about, like I did with David Scott. It's going to take more than just a few new tools. And that's a good thing. Because what God wants to do in us is larger and grander than we could ever think, ask for, or imagine. Ever been somewhere that you've never been before? Exploring is fun, but figuring out where you are and what's around you is even better. My wife and I try and travel every couple of years just to spend some time together. And some years ago, we went to Las Vegas. We were there for a couple of days and we were checking some things out and looking at the sights. We have some dear friends there, Pastors Rachel and Henry Sneed. And around about the second or third day, we connected with them. Do you know that when we got in touch with them and they showed us where to go, they told us what we could go see, we had a better time because we had guides who knew us, knew what we liked and didn't like. They knew the area, what was really available, what was off the beaten path, so to speak. I want you to know that God has a guide for us. We need a guide for our reset, both corporately but also individually. And mercifully, God has granted us one in His Holy Spirit. We all have a personal guide in the person of God's Holy Spirit. And what I want to do is we're going to work through Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. I want to read these verses again. Paul writes, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, when people speak of the Spirit and some of those types of things, I want to muster all the honesty and transparency and exhortive ability that I have. Entities and dynamics like hope, and spirit tend to get painted with a a flippant and inconsistent brush. They're spoken about as if they're random or erratic, even as if God himself were temperamental. We discussed last week how heavenly hope hits different in its heavy, tangible character, very different than the light and wispy, care bear, dreamlike scenario that we think about it in. Can I tell you that God's presence is more palpable than some pipe dream. He's constant. He is known in the scriptures as the finisher. He's described as foundational. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Hebrews 15, we read this passage yet last week, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power or influence of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. John chapter 14, let me go there real quickly. I was going to carry on to another point. But in John chapter 14, again, talking about the tangible nature of hope and spirit, Jesus says, chapter 14 of the gospel of John, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Tangible, reactive realities in our circumstance. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be my loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, just for a moment, 
Aren't you happy the disciples who walked with Jesus had questions just like we do? Jesus answered in verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. Verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Verse 28, you heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. Here's my unfettered opinion, church. I think we all like to think of God, Holy Spirit's intimate role in particular, as inconsistent and unpredictable because that absolves us of things like obedience, self-discipline, self-control, death to self for the sake of resurrection. We want God's resurrection power, but we are unwilling to die to ourselves. Heavenly hope, as we spoke about last week, stabilizes us so that we can see the ways of the Spirit. I referenced the story, the narrative in the scripture, Matthew chapter 14, where Jesus sends the disciples out into the boat. And as they go out into the boat, he goes up into the mountain to pray. As they're out there, a storm kicks up. And of course, they're freaking out. They're losing their minds. Jesus goes out to them. As he goes out to them, Peter's frightened, thinks he's a ghost, realizes it's Jesus, and says, hey, if that's you, call me out. Of course, many of us know the story and the narrative, and Jesus invites him out. Peter walks on the water until he notices the winds and the waves, loses track of Jesus, and he begins to sink. And of course, Jesus reaches out and brings him up. Many people have preached that Peter doesn't actually walk in the water, but he walks in the words of invitation. He walks in the reality that God has called him out. And as Peter is focused on Jesus, it's Jesus himself and those promises that Peter is stepping out on. The fact of the matter is that God's hope, God's Holy Spirit, the the person of the Holy Spirit is not light and wispy and random and erratic, but he's hard and fast. Do you know that the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2, which again was promised by Jesus, the risen Jesus in Acts chapter 1 says to the disciples, don't go anywhere, don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes, until I give you what I've promised. And so in Acts chapter 2, all the disciples are afraid. They're all wondering what's going to happen next, but they're gathered together. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. It's just like a mighty rushing wind. That's often pointed to by many followers of Jesus as a random move of God. But the day of Pentecost is not the day the Holy Spirit fell. It's actually a Jewish holiday where they celebrated the first fruits. God was using the hard and fast reality of relationship with him that was already in place to move in their lives. What I want to do quickly is work through Galatians chapter 5 and look at some of the hard and fast principles of God's Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16, we're going to work through down to verse 26. Verse 16 through 18, Paul writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Our movement, our way of being and living should and can be in conjunction with God's leading, not just our carnal desires. Now, a word about that. Carnal desires aren't just inappropriate sexual desires. Carnal means our own making, what we can manufacture, putting our hope in ourselves rather than God who's inviting us out. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. 
sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. Come on, church. These are all the good ones. Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. First, excuse me, the kingdom of God is not a place. It's not heaven out there after we pass away. Kingdom of God was a terminology for the economy, a means of productivity and fruitfulness. And Paul is speaking to very nuanced specifics of carnality that we should not enter into because if we do those things, they are markers that we are not in God's way, but we are walking our own way. Verse 22. Take a sip of water, church. There we go. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Work through the fruits of the Spirit, church. Listen to them and engage them as you in, as you engage with and interact with the people around you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the dynamics of fruitfulness in our lives as we're going God's way, as we are keeping in step with the Spirit. Verse 24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let me read that again. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Very simply put, when you're talking about relating to God's Holy Spirit, which is an incredible intimate and personal relationship, you belong to God as you continue to give yourself to Him. I belong to God as I continue to give myself to Him. And yes, that means sometimes saying no to the flesh. It means entering into that fruitfulness of self-control and discipline. Verses 25 and 26. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. That last verse, those last two verses, let me read them again. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Because the Spirit's always moving, the Spirit's always engaging, the Spirit's always inviting. Verse 26, let us not become, and then Paul goes through three things, conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. I would submit to you that these last two verses simply say, Keeping in step with the Spirit is rooted in kindness and how we treat one another. God is not a GPS. I don't know a lot of people, myself included, have used that as an illustration and a, a preaching point. But God isn't a GPS. The, the scriptures themselves aren't just roadmaps for life that we can lay over our circumstances. Those reductionist views, while maybe being illustrative for a moment and, and can pull out principles, they're problematic in large part because a GPS only works when I type in where I want to go, where I am, and where I think I want to end up. We are at the center of them. That's the problem. We have a guide in Holy Spirit as we make Him our focus. It's a crazy idea, right? When we look for God, we find Him. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, it says, Ask and seek and knock. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The crazy idea, let me just say that again. The crazy idea is that when you look for God, you will find Him. Let me put that in the context of the Spirit. When you look for God's Spirit, you will see Him. When you listen for God's Spirit, you will hear Him. If you're frustrated because there's a lack of seeing God's Spirit in your life, if you're confused or irritated at the lack of God's voice in your life, I would submit to you the question, when was the last time you looked 
for His Spirit in your life? When was the last time you listened for His Spirit to speak to you? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says, Seek ye first. There's a prioritizing that God really wants in your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Again, we see that not as a place, but as an economy of thought, an economy of interaction. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We have a guide in God's Holy Spirit, but we need to make ourselves available to him. Can I speak to parents today? How much fun is it when you're having a conversation with your young person and they're not making eye contact? Are you with me? They're either looking over here, looking over there, or engaged in their phone. How honored do you feel when you speak to a young person and they're going like this? How loved do you feel when you're trying to engage with your spouse, but they're looking at their phone? Eye contact is critical as we are speaking to one another. It's one of the reasons why social media platforms and texting and all of those kinds of things kind of throw me into a social, like, soul vertigo because I have a hard time connecting and relating to people people when I'm not looking at them. Where is your focus on God's Holy Spirit? Because if you put your focus on him and his presence, I promise you, not on my promise, but because Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. When we focus on him, God reveals himself to us. I know it's going to be hard, and I know it's a bit of a different learning curve as you put new habits and patterns into place. But I want you to know, God has a guide for you in his Holy Spirit. Let me leave you with a benediction, church. May we look to, listen for, and align ourselves with God's ways and means. May we be fully led by God's ultimate guide in His Holy Spirit as we give ourselves to Him. And may we remember that with Jesus, it only gets better.